Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Pound for Pound Leader Podcast. This is Mike Kai, your host, and I'm so grateful to be with you today on this beautiful day in Hawaii. As you notice, I have a hat here with the island of Hawaii. It's named after this. The state is named after the island of Hawaii, and I'm grateful to be with you today. We get to interview my great friend, Joel Holm. He's an author. He's a consultant, entrepreneur. Joel has a passion to help corporations, churches, and civic organizations make a long-lasting impact through creative entrepreneurial initiatives. Joel brings a wealth of insight and learning to every forum in which he speaks and leads, and that is the truth. I've seen him in action for over seven years when he's been with us. Uh, so I'm excited to jump into the conversation with my good friend, Joel Holm. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. I have again with me my really good friend, Joel Holm, hey Mike. all the way from California. Yep. And it's been a few years since we've last been able to see one another in Hawaii. World's been a little busy. <laughs> That's to say the least. And, uh, and it's good to have you back because this is the third podcast that you'll be doing with yeah, us. Yeah, it's great to but, be back. But the first one with the Inspire Collective. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's good to have you. So how's everything in California at the moment? Things are good. You know, uh, I always think things are good. You can always see the bad. It takes yeah. a little bit of an extra effort to see the good. But if you see the good, ah, things go better. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Always have to look at the bright side, look at the silver linings, see God's plan through it all. Some people say the glass is half full. Some people say the glass is half empty. I just say, thank God we got a glass. <laughs> I got a glass. I got a life to live. I'm going to live it to the fullest. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, Joel, you know, this is the first time on the Inspire Collective podcast, and we're talking to people who are from the seven mountains, uh, spheres, streams, whatever you want to call them, or gates. And they all are very, very important. You know, lately, maybe in the last three years, we've been taking more of an emphasis on that to be able to infiltrate every every area of society with the good news of Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and, and the message that he has for us to be salt and light. And so what has it been like for you being a world traveler, working with a handful of churches and pastors, and then the pandemic happens. And then, so what did your schedule look like from going all the way to Australia, New Zealand, or wherever you were going until all of a sudden you, you are in California for two years? Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, it was an adjustment for sure. Mm -hmm. And at first you have to kind of try to find a rhythm and it was hard to find a rhythm because things kept changing. But my guy learned an amazing lesson about how to find a rhythm within an inconstant Mm. always changing. So mm. I was probably before that more dependent upon the circumstances around me yeah. to find a rhythm. And all of a sudden everything was changing and I was out of control. I couldn't control what mandates were coming down. I couldn't control travel. So I had to find another way inside of me to find a stability and a way to develop the dream I had, the vision I had, even when the circumstances were always changing. So for me, it was a great two years of discovering a whole new learning lesson. So what was the rhythm that you found or what did you change in your rhythm um, during that two years? I think uh, probably more than anything, it was the ability to identify creativity in the middle of chaos. Mm. So the Bible even talks about this, make the most of every opportunity right. for the days are evil, crazy, uh, upside down in a sense. And you've got to find how the chaos actually gives you an opportunity for creativity. You and I have been talking about this as it relates to people in their businesses and even pastors with their churches. You know, what was, what is, and what can be. So yeah. what was was before the pandemic. Right. And now we're in this situation where we've been changed. Businesses have been hurt. Uh, churches have been affected. And a lot of people are looking back. Got to get back to what was. Yeah. We talked about, no, no, we want to look forward. Yeah. What can be. Yeah. And I think it's the creativity within the chaos. How do you identify God's creative ideas? Leveraging the chaos that is there for the best opportunity to go forward. I love that because what was, what is, and what can be, yeah. you're so right. Because we always try to look back on what was, and we want to get back to what it was like right. uh, pre-pandemic. And, you know, then what, what, whatever it is, we are all trying to look back to get back to, but you can't do that, right? You have to innovate. You have to ideate. You have to, you have to be absolutely creative in order not just to survive, because we don't want to just be in survival mode. We wanted to be in thriving mode. So yeah. just thrive through it. I feel like we've, sort of thrive through it. What's your what's your outlook from the outside of Inspire Church, the Inspire Collective? Yeah. What, what do you see? What did you see with us or what do you see with other people? You know, I think you're spot on. I think you have really uh, thrived through it. I mm. think everybody had this adjustment. But recognizing, if anything, in some really good way, I think for all of us, it was a really good wake-up call. Yeah. 
what really matters? Yeah. Why am I on this planet? And the in one sense, the fragility of it. And yet this wake up call, and I think uh, Inspire has really thrived in saying, number one, we're going to stay true to our values. We're mm. not going to adjust any of our core values, who we are, what we've been called to do. Yeah. But we're going to go forward with this. Uh, I think that I think it's been a, a great season, a testing season. The Bible talks about, you know, you'll be tested and you come out the other side. You are going to be so much stronger and so much more resilient. Uh, we can handle the last two years. We can handle much of what's in front of us. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. So when I look at the testings, right, and the pace that people are running, how do we run? How do business owners, how do um, how do homeschooling moms, how yeah. does everybody run a sustainable pace? I think uh, the Bible gives us a lot of insight into that really important question. Um, I think the answer is probably in the question itself. So when you say, how do you run a sustainable pace? You got to ask yourself the question, is my current pace sustainable? Mm -hmm. Now, you and I know that there are windows of time, seasons, when because of the need that's there, you got to ramp it up. Yeah. And you know, I don't have to do this forever, but in this window of time, it's going to be crazy. Is your pace sustainable? And you've got to have an honest answer about that. You go, hey, if this is the pace that I need to work at in order for my business to flourish, I can't sustain this pace. My business is going to collapse. I got to find a different way to do that. Then there's another answer the Bible gives that I think is really important. And I think it's why the collective is so important. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. Mm. If you want to run far, run together. And if you're running alone, yeah. it's not a sustainable pace. No. If you're running together, you're part of a collective, you're part of a team of people, there is an energy that comes from that, that God works through, that gives you the sustainability. Because there are times, and you and I are good friends, this has happened where... I hit a wall, I'm not running as fast, and you kind of help me over the wall. Mm. And you allow me to keep my pace because you're encouraging me, you're texting me, you're talking to me, and vice versa. So I think those two things, you got to do an honest assessment. Is my pace sustainable? And am I running too much alone? Do I need to be running with other people? You know, it's interesting while you were talking about the pace, I was thinking about you're either a, uh, you could be a sea level runner or you could be a person like a Kenyan runner, right? <laughs> the Kenyan runners, they, they practice in the high altitudes, yeah. but they practice together. And when they run their marathons, they run them together. And then the best of the best start to break away from everybody else and maybe the last yeah. six miles and they start to differentiate themselves from the rest of the pack. Yeah. But they are always together. They enter the races together. They train together. Well, well, runners will tell you this, and it's an interesting analogy, and I don't run. I, I can't drive 26 miles without something. I don't run. Home. I only run if there's a goal, if there's a ball in my hand, or a dog is chasing me. That's the only way I run. But they will always tell you about who's setting the pace. Right. And there may be an individual who's setting the pace in a race, and that individual may not actually be designated on the team as the one who's going to cross the finish line first, yeah. but they set the pace for the rest of us. When I do run, mm. if I've got somebody running who keeps a pace ahead of me, I can keep that pace. Yeah. If I'm on my own, I can't keep that pace. And that's where it becomes so important. Even in our relationships, I got to be around people who can set a pace that mm. on my own, I can't set, but together, yeah. it's going to help me move on farther and faster. So going along that pace setter theme, I'm thinking, okay, so not a lot of, maybe not a lot of people have coffee talks like our Inspire Collective has. Yeah. People who are brand new to the collective or just got this podcast might be thinking, well, I don't have a group of business people or marketplace people. The other 98%, the 2% work in churches, they work in, in, in yeah, ministries right, right. or in missions. I don't have that, but I have a pace setter that lives across the ocean. And that would be more like a mentor, a yeah. mentor pace setter, or I'm, I'm, I'm being mentored from a distance. They may not know it. I've bought their masterclass. Right. What do you think about content and pace? You ever thought about that? The content and the pace that's been put out there lately? I think there's a, a variety of ways in which you can uh, not only equip yourself, but manage then the pace of what happens. And they mm. do relate, here's how. If I am better equipped, I'm gonna have a stronger pace. Mm. If I'm stronger in my body, if my muscles, if my lungs, I keep a much stronger pace. So equipping myself, yeah. uh, wherever that source is, I think what matters is you've got to be really honest as to who's really feeding me, mm. who is really helping me develop that pace. I got to be real about it. I don't care if they're halfway across the ocean or next door. I'd rather get input from somebody who's halfway across the ocean digitally than somebody who's next door if it's not as effective, if it doesn't really work. I think it's okay 
to be a little selfish and saying, I need people around me who will help me advance my pace. Because you know God puts all the pieces together yeah. in that sense. I mean, we've seen people slow other people's paces down. Yeah. I mean, that's common. It's very common. And it's hard to find, lack of a better word, a thoroughbred or a greyhound yeah. that can run with you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're yeah, few I, and far between. So what, what's your outtake on that? I think you do have to really be intentional in measuring in your season who do you need to run alongside of that will help advance your pace mm -hmm. and be able to do that and be able to do that well. And then it takes a measure of intentionality, especially if you're in business, especially if you're starting up. There's so much that's involved. You're juggling so many balls in the air. Right. And a lot of times this is the kind of stuff that takes the back seat, mm -hmm. but it really needs to take the front seat because it's about longevity. It is about sustainability. Um, it doesn't matter if you can make profit in the first year. Can you make profit in the 10th year? Right. And that sustainability is such an important measurement. And, and right now we live in such a fragile topsy-turvy. That sustainability becomes even more important because the economic climate used to change in seasons, now it changes almost every year. So yeah. you've got to have that stability and that comes through those relations. Or it changes majorly every four years, <laughs> depending <laughs> depending what's happening. Um, so where do you see the greatest opportunities for innovation in ministry and the marketplace right now? What, what are the, where do you see the greatest opportunities? I can only tell you what I am experiencing. Uh, I think perhaps, especially in the marketplace, um, the greatest opportunities for me are in the, in the arenas and the spheres, you talk about the seven spheres, mm -hmm. where you can bring the most value to people's lives. Right. God seems to be really, have his hand on that element. Yeah. And in, in a sphere where you, I can bring the most value. I have a friend and he runs a B2B marketing. So businesses to businesses. Mm. And he had an opportunity to get a massive multi-million dollar client with a, a hospital. And his job is to create orientation, digital orientation for new people, patients who are going to the hospital. So he creates this whole graphic interface where you go online and you can click into the administrator's office, the doctor's office, and it helps people who are terrified. Right. Because they got cancer and they're going to the hospital and stuff like that. Mm. And I said, do you see how God's going to use you to bring his peace and his grace to all these patients? And through that, do you see how your business is going to flourish? There's a bottom line you got to measure, and yeah. he's highly profitable. But there is another line you got to measure too. And I think innovation is being mostly creative mm. in areas where you can say, my business, it's actually bringing value to society. And that can be in anything. It doesn't have to be in healthcare. It can be in education. It can be in just providing jobs. Right. I'm just providing jobs in a sense. I got a buddy who's got a factory on the south side of Chicago and he imports tea, he repackages it, and he sells it to uh, restaurants and stuff. And he put his manufacturing plant in the worst neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Wow. Because part of his objective was to hire young men who otherwise may end up in prison. Right. And God sees that. Wow. And God says, here's where I can dump my favor on it. Yeah. And his business is through the roof, but he's got another bottom line, not just the financial bottom yeah. line. And that's, I think, where we have we have the ace in the hole called the Holy Spirit yeah. for creativity when it comes to being entrepreneurial in these spheres of society. I love that. I, I think it, I, I think when people begin to make the shift in their head that I'm doing this because I can make a difference and I am that salt preservative, that flavoring, I am the light, I shine the light, but through what I do, when people flip that switch and they come to the realization that they get the revelation that, okay, I'm not just, this is not just putting food on the table. This is not just providing a paycheck. There's a purpose behind this paycheck. Yeah. And there's a purpose behind someone else's paycheck that I'm helping employ them so that they can make a living and they can put their kids through college, hopefully one day. And one of the best exercises you can do if you are, especially in business, but in any sphere, mm -hmm. is you can say, what is the problem that exists that my job or my business exists to solve and define that problem by people? Mm. Okay, so people don't have jobs. Okay, so I can create jobs. People don't have good health care. Okay, I can be a doctor. Mm -hmm. People don't have this understanding. I can be a teacher. You know, if you can define the problem that exists in society that your work is addressing, wow, not only that, but you really inspire your workforce, especially if you're hiring younger people. They want their lives to make a difference. And if you can define their role, not just as a job, a cog in a machine, but we exist because there's a problem and we're solving that problem and we're bringing meaning to people's lives. I mean, that's what God asks us to do. What would be the power behind the owner of a business? Like what, what privilege and power is there in being a Christian business owner? 
Okay, I'm gonna answer that question, but I gotta ask you a question first. Mm. What's with the hat? <laughs> um, I can't understand the hat, and you gotta explain I wear hats. That. You know, you see I know me you hats. wear hats, but... Not professionally. Well, I, I'm, I'm wearing a hat because I'm trying to grow something out uh, in in my hair, uh, I don't like I don't like the style that it is. It's what what are you laughing at? I don't like the <laughs> there's something wrong. There's something wrong with this hairdo. So okay. I'm wearing a hat, and even if I were to gel it or or pomade it, it's not going to look good. Second thing is, I just want to rep this island. This is the big island of Hawaii, and this is my favorite island. And I didn't know if you like spilt food on your head or what it was. Yeah, it's. Yeah, most people they have no idea. Yeah, I was true. in Kansas City. I wore a hat like this, and people are looking at me like they have no idea. So maybe one percent knew what this was. This is an island, everybody. This is an island, and it's the best island. It's called the Big Island. And so, anyway, that's why I'm wearing the hat. Why? Why'd you divert me? Anyway, moving right along. So I got an answer for your question though, because yeah. that's a great question. When you are a I forgot owner, the question. The when power. You are, when you are a business owner, uh, I think even if you're not the owner. Again, these seven spheres. Right, the manager. You're a creator. Right. You have, if you see yourself as a creator, right. I have the opportunity to create. I can create wealth. I can create joy. Mm -hmm. I can create peace. Right. God gives us his image. He makes us like him. He's a creator. So we oftentimes see him as a savior or a counselor. Right. That's legitimate. Yeah. He's a creator. Yeah, so you can create order when there's chaos in the work environment. We are creators. And you see yourself as a creator. And it's a great, again, it's a great way to say, what is it God's asked me to create? Mm. What do I create? And as a business owner, if you can answer that well, man, you you got your compass set in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Joel, I want to I want to, I want to switch gears. So we've gone from creating, we've gone, we've gone from pace setting. Um, what do you feel are the leadership qualities that separate good leaders from great leaders in the times that we live in? Oh, I can tell you what I honestly believe is the one most important leadership quality. And I don't know whether or not you or others will agree with this, but it's not faith, it's not courage, it's not vision. Those things are incredibly important. I think the most important leadership quality is self-awareness. Mm. You know who you are. Yeah. You know how God's wired you. You know why you're on this planet. You know your strengths, you know your weaknesses. When you know who you are in Christ, you can do anything. Right. Because nothing will stand in your way. Most of the obstacles that exist in our way of fulfilling our dreams are our own obstacles. Right. It's my insecurity. It's my fear. And those are wrapped around, I don't know who I am in Christ. If I'm comfortable in my skin, then I can surround myself with people who far exceed me. And I'm okay with that. If I'm not comfortable in my skin, mm -hmm. everybody I surround myself with, has got to be dumber than I am. Mm. And it'll put a great limitation on what I can do. Mm. So for me, self-awareness is probably the most important leadership trait because so much is changing all the time. And what needs to be stable is you mm. got to know who you are in Christ. Then, then I know my calling. I know my part in the world. I know in my dent. I know I'm not like a Mike Kai. I'm not going to measure myself mm. against a Mike Kai. I'm going to measure myself by a Joel Holman self. And I think working towards a clear understanding it's a spiritual pursuit it's a leadership pursuit i got to be self-aware i got to be really comfortable in my skin that is so true so did that self-awareness come into play was it honed at the level that it is today when you went from a pastor of a mega church in chicago yeah. to consultant and now you're going from basically right well i'll give business. you i'll give you the honest story yeah. uh because god gives you experiences to let you hone it whether or not you take advantage of those experiences is up to you. So I'm leading a large church. And when you're leading a large church, you get a lot of connection, a lot of notoriety. And then I'm no longer leading a large church. So I'm no longer part of the good old boys club. Right. And all of a sudden I'm isolated and I'm kind of on my own and you're just in a different category. And I had to say, okay, how much of my value was I attached towards that label I had? I was leading a big church. That label's gone now. Yeah. And God used that moment to say, Joel, okay, you got to become more self-aware. You got to know how I've wired you and who you are in me. And you got to be cool with that. There's a figure in the Bible that I think is one of the coolest figures, and it's Barnabas. Because Barnabas was a leading figure. And then Paul comes around. You right. know what Barnabas does? He says, you guys got to listen to him. Yeah. I know I'm a good preacher, but you got to listen to him. Yeah. Barnabas was so comfortable in his skin that he was that kind of personality. And I think God will give all of us experiences to hone that self-awareness whether or not we are ready for it or have the maturity to embrace it. And then the other way you do it is you got to surround yourself. Again, we talk about pacing and running with people. Yeah. You got to surround yourself with really good people who can help you 
know who you are and be comfortable in your skin. People who accept you warts and all. And uh, that can be a, a great strength. So, Joel, we talked about the number one quality, and that would be self-awareness. In my view, yeah. In it's your really view. Important, right, yeah. right. So then if that's the number one quality, what investments do you feel leaders need to make or practices they need to adopt in order to have greater productivity and self-awareness? That's a, that's a really great question. And uh, I, since I am a minister, I'll give you a biblical answer. Okay. It's one of the coolest stories, I think. We're all tempted, right? Mm -hmm. I'm tempted. You're tempted. We just never talk about it. Yeah. I don't want to tell you what I'm dealing with, my temptations. And and in the Christian world, mm -hmm. sometimes we equate temptation to sin even. Right. If I'm tempted, I'm, no, you're not. Jesus was tempted. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to let the world know. Yeah. And when he was tempted, I mean, it was a legit temptation, like you and I are tempted. It wasn't like just some kind of hyper-spiritual thing. Legit temptation. And here's what the main temptation was. So if you're the son of God, mm -hmm. and Jesus is tempted about his identity, self-awareness. Right. It's the one temptation he got. If you are. If you are. Mm -hmm. If you really think you are. And there, there was this looming temptation that was there. Now, we won't do it now, but there's this great study where you take the three statements that Satan made to Jesus and you compare them with the three statements that Jesus made to Peter when yeah. he was bringing them back in. Wow. Jesus comes to Peter. You know what the first thing he asks him? Do you love me? Right. So here's Satan trying to stop Jesus from his ministry, his calling, whether whatever that calling may be, right. business, education, ministry. Yeah. And he says, if you are, identity temptation. We all deal with it. Yeah. Here's Jesus talking to Peter, same situation, ministry calling, yeah. do you love me? What are some of the habits that you engage? You got to really fall in love with Jesus. Right. I don't mean to simplify it down to that. Yeah. You got to fall in love with Jesus and you got to know Christ's heart for you. That's how you gain that self-awareness. That's what you, you become so comfortable in who you are in Jesus. That all that other stuff that yeah. we attach to identity, right. power, wealth, Platform, all that stuff, likes, notoriety, it, it, followers, it, compared to the fact that the Jesus Christ yeah. loves me, yeah. and I get to love Him, it really diminishes all that, and it becomes crystal clear as to who I am and my identity. Uh, it's a biblical uh, paradigm for us. Uh, if you're struggling with a self awareness, you got to fall in love with Jesus. That's the truth. It's just that, that is the truth. It is that simple. It really and is. And it is the truth. Well, there's a great verse in John 15 where he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, right. which is what we're talking about, right. you will bear fruit. You want to be productive? Right. You want to be off the charts with your business? You want to have a huge influence? If you abide in me and I abide in you. Mm. Because what that creates, I have a self-awareness. And then I am truly able to be used by God in whatever way he wants to use me. So when we talked about that, the, the simplicity of that, yeah. I mean, it's simple. And if we just did that more often, every day, yeah. just abided in him, we would bear so much more fruit. So much more fruit. Instead of running on fumes, right? And going in our own strength. Yeah. So with that simplicity, simplify is a word that you use a lot. You use, let's simplify this, <laughs> right? Joel Holm, the simplify guy. <laughs> Because um, I'm a you, simple guy. No, you're not. Well, you kind of, yeah, you are. You're not complex. You're simple. Yeah. And I like that. I love that about you. And it's a compliment. Right? I'll take it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Some people are <laughs> complex, right? You're not complex. You're yeah. You're, yeah. But I'll tell you why. Why? Okay. Here's why I think simplicity is such an important value. To me, simplicity equals clarity. And clarity is the doorway to fruitfulness. So if people are not clear, right. they don't know what to do. Your employees don't know what to do. They're not clear what their jobs are, what their jobs are not. They're not clear how they're being measured. Clear, if there's not a clarity, if there's a lack of clarity, yeah. then you're kind of paralyzed. You know, pastors, we look at people and they're not involved. And a lot of times we think they're lazy. They're not lazy. They're just confused. Mm. They don't know where to go. They don't know who to talk to. They don't know what to do. Yeah. So if you simplify, then it's clear. And when there's clarity, yeah. the consumer knows what they're buying. The employee knows what they're doing. The clarity makes the world of a difference. And if you can simplify, so the religious leaders come to Jesus, 613 Old Testament laws, they say, okay, what really matters? And here's what he does, brilliant. He takes 613 laws and says, two, love God, love others. Mm -hmm. Without diminishing any of the 613, yeah. two. Yeah. That's why simplify is so important because it brings clarity and clarity helps everybody move forward. That's awesome, Joel. Everybody listening to Joel Holm, good friend, consultant, pr practitioner, entrepreneur, author. 
Uh, he's absolutely passionate about helping corporations, churches, and civic organizations make a long-lasting impact through creative entrepreneurial initiatives. It's a mouthful. Distill that for us, would you please? I'll give you an example of it. Yeah. I just did this because I travel all the time, right. but not for the last two years. Yeah. So my wife's going nuts. Like, you're not leaving yet. When are you <laughs> <laughs> She's going crazy. What am I going to do? I mean, yeah, I sure I do some stuff on Zoom, but I've got extra time. Yeah. So I look and do a, you, you have to do kind of this scope. You have to always be forecasting, mm -hmm. you know, you got to be looking at the environment around you and seeing what things are coming, what need there is. And I discovered kind of a need that was there. I really do believe for people of faith, right. when you open the word, you have this moment with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, the Bible is just really intimidating. And they don't have the wherewithal to go to a 45 minute teaching on something. So I created an app during this pandemic. It's called the Bible Guide app. I like and that. All I did, I took the 550 New Testament passages and I created a three minute audio explanation. I downloaded it yesterday. Did you? Yeah, yeah you can I haven't listened it. to it yet, but I will. Three minute, all I wanted to do was explain. I didn't want to teach. Yep. There's plenty of good sermons on there. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give people a tool so they could read something out of Romans, which can be confusing, and then listen to a three minute audio and then go back and go, oh, that's what it's talking about. And then they have a moment with the Holy Spirit. So for me, that's simplicity. I saw a need, a need for something really simple. It's not everything, it's not the catch-all. Right, right. But it fit this niche where there's just this simplicity where people who would otherwise read the book of Leviticus right. can now go, Oh, yeah, that's what it's about. And then they and the Holy Spirit can have a moment. I like that because I, re I often refer to my Holman Bible handbook, yeah. the old Holman Bible handbook written in 1960 something. And I refer to that just so I can get a refresher on what is this book about. Yeah. This, I mean, this app is going to be uh, is going to be awesome. I think I, we're going to promote it. Um, how do they get it? It's free. It's on both Android and Apple. It's just called the Bible Guide app. The Bible it's Guide really, app. And, it's, and it doesn't do everything. I think that's a really important principle, especially in business. Yeah. You can't do everything. Yeah. Find out what you can do. And all this does is that it's not interactive. You can't, it doesn't build community groups. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. For every chapter, I wrote a one paragraph chapter thought. Wow. So any chapter of the For Bible, every chapter, every chapter. So any chapter of the Bible, you read this one paragraph. You're busy, and then you read. Yeah, it's like either that or listen to my wife yell at me. So I was going to do that. You read this. <laughs> Marie, you heard that. You read this one paragraph, and then you read that chapter. Yeah, it's going to help you. Here's the key, though. I like you that. can't do everything. Keeping it simple yeah. sometimes also means pruning. A really important biblical principle, and it's a principle in business, especially. John 15, Jesus says, "You prune. Mm. You don't just prune the dead branches." Yeah. You prune the living branches. You got to right. cut back sometimes. You got to be really clear yeah. as to what your objective is and what you're trying to accomplish. And the more clutter there is, and I see guys who are running businesses and they're trying to, you know, they're not everybody is Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can carry that. You got to be clear as to what your objective. You got to be clear as to what you're calling. You got to be clear as to the dent God is asking you to make in the world. Clarity and simplicity, I think, really can help you be incredibly productive. Joel, we're about to head into a series at our church. We just got out of a, one. We, we're, we're in one right now called Saints in the City, right? Helping the church, the people, be, understand that they are the saints right. and we are in the city. Yeah. What would that mean to you as we close and wrap this up for people who are listening to this podcast, watching this podcast, that they are a saint in the city? Yeah. Mike, that's such a great question. And it's probably a controversial answer I'm going to give you. Okay. Um, because I have noticed, especially on the mainland, there is a trend for some Christians to be relocating to regions of America that are more Christian-ish. Right. And you know, I don't fault them for that. I get it on one hand. Yep, I get it too. I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. But there's also a real benefit to staying where things are not Christian-ish. Right. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Amen. And I think it's a great thought where you say, you know what? I'm here on this planet for a window of time to be salt and light. That's why I'm here. Yeah. I'm not here just to create a Christianist environment around me that makes it easier for me. And I don't say that disparagingly to people who have yeah. relocated. I get that. Right. But for the people who aren't relocating yeah. and some just can't, yeah. their job, their family, they can't. Yep. Wow. I've worked with Christians in other parts of the world where they're really not just discriminated against, they are persecuted. 
Christians in China, Christians in North Korea, these are some of the strongest Christians I know. Yeah. They have so much faith. Yeah. They have so much joy. Their life in the natural may not be easy. Being a saint in the city, if you stay in some of these cities, your life in the natural may not be easy, but you will flourish. You will have so much faith so good. and so much joy because yeah. you are on the cutting edge of what the Lord is doing and you are right there in the thick of it. And that brings a richness to life that a natural safety could never replace. That's so good, Joel. I think a lot of people needed to hear that. And uh, and there are those that felt felt called to leave and they sure. left and good for them. And, you know, in, in some ways, I envy them in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little bit, but I know that I'm called here yeah. and uh, I know I'm called to, to be that one of the saints in the city. Because yeah. if we all leave, what is it? What would, what would California be if we all left? Well, you think about it. I mean, you can study left. church history. There was a monastic movement before the Dark Ages where things got so bad, everybody went off into the mountains and you had all these monasteries start. And they said, when you get your side of your act together, we'll come back together. And everything disappeared. Wow. The gospel disappeared. The church disappeared. Everything went dark. Yeah. You know, we are salt and light. We are a city on a hill. Mm. So when people are walking at nighttime, they didn't have electricity and the moon would shine and cities were made of limestone and the mm -hmm. moon would shine off it and they would see the light and they would go, that's where safety is. I really do have a conviction that we are entering a season of great harvest, but there's gotta be a place for them to go yeah. where they know they can be safe. There's gotta be that light that they've gotta be able to go to. And Jesus says, that's why I put you here for that purpose. So I'm excited about it. My life may not be easier living in Southern California, yeah. although it's not a bad place to live. It's not a bad place to live. But I'm grateful yeah. that I get to be a part of seeing what God is doing on this planet and having some role in being salt and light in it. Mm. Thank you, Joel, it's good to have you. My pleasure. Thank you for being on the podcast. Nice hat. Thank you. <laughs> wow, what a wealth of knowledge hanging out with Joel Holm. That was so great. I want to make sure that you subscribe to this podcast. So make sure that you click that link or whatever, hit the subscribe button on the podcast. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to all of this. this is very, very valuable content. And I'm sure you're going to find this absolutely a great resource. Tell all your friends about it, all your business associates about it, whoever goes to your connect group. Whatever sphere that you are in, we pray that this content actually helps you move the needle further in whatever you are doing for God. Remember, we are salt and light, and God has put us in the sphere that we are in to make a difference in this world. Until I talk to you later on, until then, God bless you, and aloha. Take care.